and this much, the ascent stage of the lunar excursion module returns to the orbiting uh, command module. They join up again. Stafford and Cernan climb back into the command module. They jettison this, throw it away, in other words, rather expensive to do. And then they fire this 20,500-pound engine on next Saturday to come back home, arrive home on Monday. And when they get into the Earth's atmosphere, just before the Earth's atmosphere, they separate. And the, just this little bit, the command module, just 12 feet high and 12 feet across, comes back and makes the landing in the Pacific. That's all that comes back of all of this, 363 feet high and 3,000 tons of it. And that's all we get back. That's the flight of the of the Apollo 10 uh, to make the prepare the way to find uh, the landing site, check out the landing site, check out the radar and all the equipment for the first time around the moon in exactly the same time schedule, exactly the same sort of flight as the moon landing, except they won't go to the surface of the moon itself. CBS News color coverage of the flight of Apollo 10 will continue in a moment. And it's now 11.44 here at, in Florida, Eastern Daylight Time. The launch of the Apollo 10 should come in one hour and five minutes and 24 seconds from now. That's the way the countdown clock is going for this launch this morning. The launch of Apollo 10 is going to inaugurate a new launch pad here on Merritt Island. Pad B, it's called, 39B to be exact. This complex was built uh, here with two launch sites, and there's room to add a third if needed. All the earlier Saturn Vs have lifted off from Pad A, which is uh, directly behind us here. And the lunar landing flight this summer, Apollo 11, is going to begin on Pad A there, three miles from us. David Shoemaker has a report, report on why we're using Pad B for Apollo 10. The decision to use Pad B seems to boil down to one simple fact. It is there. Of course, there is a somewhat more complex bureaucratic explanation involving what are called recycle times that two pads can more quickly handle Apollos 9, 10, and 11. But in fact, Apollo 10 was not rolled out until 9 went into orbit, and 11 won't come out of the huge vehicle assembly building until 10 is launched. So, while one $23 million pad is being used, the other $28 million pad is virtually deserted. Like the explanation for Vietnam, the reason for two launch pads has changed over the years, depending partly on the outlook at the time, partly by who is doing the explaining. Originally, the hope was that rockets would be blasting off almost monthly, and sometimes even simultaneously. When Congress failed to get quite that enthused over the space program, officials began to emphasize the safety margin. If a rocket blows up on one pad, it is said, there would be no delay switching to the second. But as we learned in the 1967 fire, which killed three astronauts, such tragedies provoke lengthy investigations, and pad damage can be repaired long before a government commission finally finishes its review and okays another launch. And if the argument for two pads has any merit, even NASA officials like G. Merritt Preston admit there is a stronger argument for operating off the same pad for every launch. There, there are advantages, as I said, to... Uh because of the constant use, you become familiar with equipment, uh, you understand it, and uh, therefore it is more reliable. And secondly, then if you only use one pad, you have to only maintain one pad. We, of course, would have to do some maintenance on the other, but it's not near the same amount of work. Not many people ever believe there'd really be a need for two launch pads, rockets simultaneously going up from pad B over there and pad A here. It was just nice to daydream about. To indulge the daydreamers, however, cost the taxpayers $20 million, an expensive dream, even by space program standards. David Schumacher, CBS News, Kennedy Space Center, Florida. David mentioned the uh, explosive power out there, the damage that could be done by an explosion on the pad. These are very critical moments as you look at that uh, Saturn V-B sitting there on the pad. Uh, that anything, of course, could happen 
All the precautions have been taken, but you've got to realize there are one million gallons of explosive fuels aboard that beast out there right now of uh, liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen, and of a kerosene-like fuel uh, similar to a jet engine fuel. One million gallons of it. And they say that if it were compressed together, it would have a explosive power of one million pounds of TNT at 50 times the Hiroshima bomb. We're five miles away at that site you see right there. That's the press site uh, uh, in that picture from the roof of the vehicle assembly building, which just a few hundred yards uh, over to uh, our backs here. Uh, this uh, is the site where the world press uh, watches these launches. Over on the left, a uh, sort of a grandstand uh, for the writing press, and over on the right, the caravans uh, for the broadcasters, radio, and television. We're expecting an announcement from Jack King in Mission Control at just about this moment. Let's listen. This is a scene of launch control here at uh, the Kennedy Space Center. That's in the vehicle assembly building just uh, beyond us here. We were told we were going to have this announcement from Jack King. We haven't heard from him yet. He is the one who keeps us uh, in touch with the countdown procedures, and uh, we expect to hear from him now in very few seconds. The this complex area over here in the vehicle assembly building and the launch control building adjoining it, where dozens of technicians are each monitoring their own television screens and their computer readouts for individual functions of this the process. Here's the announcement. Control. We're coming up on 60 minutes and counting. Mark, T minus 60 minutes and counting. T minus 60, we are proceeding at this time. The 363 foot Apollo. Saturn V space vehicle is go, as are the tracking elements, weather, all conditions ready for a launch at 12.49 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. At this point in the countdown, we're beginning some uh, final uh, telemetry checks, and we're bringing up the various radio frequencies concerned with the launch vehicle. These include two key tracking beacons uh, located in the instrument unit, which gives us back tracking information during the powered phase of flight. All still well with the... Uh, Apollo 10 astronauts, Tom Stafford, John Young, and Gene Cernan aboard the spacecraft at the 320-foot level. This is launch control. The 320-foot level, which is right up there in the command module of the total height of this vehicle, 363 feet. In other words, they're 32 stories above the ground. And why can't this lunar module land on this particular flight? Well, we can get an explanation of that from Nelson Benton and Scott McLeod at the Grumman Aircraft plant in Bethpage, Long Island. Walter, there was some small debate at NASA after the successful flight around the moon of Apollo 8 as to whether the moon landing flight would be Apollo 10, this one, or Apollo 11, the next one. That was quickly resolved. It would be Apollo 11. But since that decision was made, there has been speculation as to whether or not this limb flying in Apollo 10 could land on the moon. If, it if there was a real-time decision to do so. Well, Scott McCloud, can LEM-4, this LEM, land on the moon if they decide to do so after getting to 50,000 feet and everything going well? Well, Nelson, I guess the answer directly is no, it cannot land on the moon. Basically, the reason is, uh, in our flight plan, we have not planned it to land there, and therefore, there is not enough fuel to go down to a landing. The reason there isn't enough fuel is so that we can have the proper amount of weight on the vehicle when we go back up for a rendezvous and docking with the command module. In other words, you want to have exactly the same weight, as close to possible, the same weight that uh, the LEM will have when it comes back to meet with the command module on 11. Yes, this is to simulate all of the conditions at lunar distance and exercise all of the systems, and we want to be as close as possible to the actual 11 flight. It's the dress rehearsal effect. Yes, it is. Are there any other systems that are not aboard that would be needed for a lunar landing? Well, I guess basically the only other difference is that we make our landing utilizing this computer. And in this flight, the ropes which guide the computer are not loaded aboard. And therefore, we could not make an automatic landing down to the surface. We do it by hand the hard way. Yes, that's right. 
So, Walter, most space flights do indeed have surprises, but at this point it looks like a real-time decision to land on the moon will not be among them. You know, Tom Stafford, a uh, uh, gentleman uh, in the weeks before this flight, when, I, when uh, we ask him, uh, is there any chance, Tom, you're gonna, just going to be there 50,000 feet from the surface of the moon, don't you? Isn't there going to be a temptation to kind of just ease her down and actually be the first man on the moon, which at one time he thought he was going to be, you know? You know it must have been quite a disappointment when they changed the series of flights so that he's not actually making the landing. But uh, when he answered that question, there was always sort of a twinkle in his eye. Some of us suspect that he might be really planning to uh, slip a fast one over and land, but it turns out he just isn't going to have the opportunity to do it. He's taken that like a good sport as he'll have the rest of his Apollo 10 crew when they say they feel that the importance of the mission is such that they're not concerned about not being the ones who land.